Happy New Year, everybody. It is officially 2024, which means that we can say goodbye to everything that happened in 2023 and say hello to some stuff that's coming out this year. As I did last year, I wanted to do a bit of a preview of some of the movies and some of the big streaming stuff that's coming out in the upcoming year. Now, this isn't everything. It's not an exhaustive list. I can never list every single release. So there may be some great stuff that I've overlooked or that might get added to the schedule later, or maybe just a sleeper hit that nobody sees coming. And and as always, and really I don't even think you need to do this caveat anymore, things can always get pushed off of the release schedule. We have several things that are in this show about 2024 that were in last year's show about 2023, although hopefully there will be no pandemics or strikes or anything that would cause things to get pushed off the release schedule long term. So without further ado, let's jump into some of what I think could be the highlights and some of the buzziest things happening in the upcoming year. And we will start in the month of January in just a few days. On January 10th, the Disney Plus series Echo will debut. This is the latest series from the MCU, but it's not coming out weekly. All episodes will be streaming on the same day, reportedly five of them. It looks like this has a harder edge than a lot of the Marvel shows that we've seen on Disney Plus, but this is one of those projects that people have marked already for potential failure. Loki may have gotten some goodwill viewership coming back to Disney Plus with the MCU, but it's certainly not in the state that Disney had hoped when they planned out this entire Marvel Universe on their streaming service. I think it looks interesting. I'll be tuning in, probably reviewing it here on the channel, but I think the jury's still very much out on Echo. Releasing on January 12th is a new version of Mean Girls, but it is not a remake of the movie. It is an adaptation of the Mean Girls musical, which has not really been at the forefront of the marketing campaign. This was originally meant for streaming, but in the era where a lot of these studios, including Paramount, are saying, well, maybe there's something to this whole theatrical distribution model. It will now be out in in theaters, it looks like it could be a fairly sizable box office hit, and it's a good way to get the buzz going for the beginning of the year. Speaking of buzz, on January 12th, The Beekeeper, Bees, from director David Ayer, hits theaters. Jason Statham plays an actual beekeeper who's also a special agent that are also called beekeepers, and he goes after Jeremy Irons, who's running a fishing scam to rip off old people. I don't really know what the hell is going on with this movie. It could be horrible. It could be great. I will be in theaters to see it, but uh, yeah, this movie looks ridiculous. Also, also on January 12th is the Book of Clarence from director James Samuel, who brought us The Harder They Fall a couple of years ago on Netflix. Lakeith Stanfield plays a guy named Clarence who's inspired by Jesus's popularity and looks to grift his way into becoming a messiah. There's a very impressive cast attached here. I'm a little bit surprised it didn't get any sort of an award season push with that early January release date, but it's one of those movies that could just kind of come and go quietly or could be a bit of a buzzy underground hit. And also, 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 also on January 12th, that's a busy day, Lyft hits Netflix, directed by F. Gary Gray. Kevin Hart leads a heist crew looking to steal millions in gold from a flight midair. Again, Netflix movies seem to be either huge hits or things that just pass by without anyone noticing, or strangely, both. But yeah, this January 12th early year date has got a lot of projects stacked up. On January 14th, True Detective returns to HBO and Max in a new series called True Detective Night Country. Jodie Foster takes the lead in a new season that is not directly tied to the others, set in Alaska as she tries to solve a murder. This looks like it has maybe kind of an insomnia vibe. Issa Lopez takes over for original True Detective creator Nick Pizzolatto, and the trailers on this look really good. I loved the first season of True Detective. I think the other seasons had great things in them, and I would like nothing more for 2024 than a return to greatness for this show. Finally, in January, on Apple TV+, Plus, Masters of the Air debuts. It's a nine-part series about pilots in World War II. Call Your Dad, starring a cast that includes Austin Butler, Callum Turner, and Barry Keoghan. It is executive produced by Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, as they did for Band of Brothers in the Pacific. And basically, this seems like the unofficial third series in that World War II trilogy with those other two shows. Not a lot of people have Apple TV+, Plus, but it's a good cast. I loved the other two series. So if Masters of the Air can approach what the other two shows did, then we could be in for a treat. 
Moving on to February, Argyle was a movie that was scheduled to be released at some point in 2023, but it's getting this February release date. It's the latest from director Matthew Vaughn, a spy action thriller starring Bryce Dallas Howard as an author, Henry Cavill as her creation, Sam Rockwell as a real spy, and a chase as Howard's books become fact and the lines blur between reality and fiction. Matthew Vaughn is a director who has made movies that I really liked and some movies that I think are very over the top. I liked the trailers for this. I liked the cast for it. So I'm going to hold out hope that this is a movie that I enjoy. On February 4th on HBO and Max, the final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm, actually, yes, for real this time, season 12 debuts. It is, of course, the long-running comedy show starring Larry David. I actually haven't watched Curb Your Enthusiasm in any number of years. Uh, maybe it's because it's hard for me to watch more than one or two episodes at a time. The cringe is just too much. Well, this is the final season of Cringe, at least from this source. On February 9th comes a movie with a great title, Lisa Frankenstein. It is the feature directorial debut of Zelda Williams, daughter of Robin Williams, with a script by Diablo Cody. Catherine Newton brings to life her dream man, who's played by Cole Sprouse, assembled from spare parts. I don't know how many kids, especially today, understand or remember Lisa Frank or understand that Lisa Frankenstein is a 10 out of 10 pun. But again, this is another movie that could go either way for me. I always hold out hope that movies are going to be good, and we'll see how this one does. Hitting theaters a little early on Valentine's Day, we get Madam Web, the feature debut of veteran TV director S.J. Clarkson. Dakota Johnson used to be in Fifty Shades of Grey movies on Valentine's Day, but here she is playing the superhero with spider-related powers that involve seeing the future, along with a team of other spider-ish people, including Sydney Sweeney. Look, this is sure to have ties to Spider-Man mythology, but it does feel like a relic of a superhero era gone by. That's the problem with always chasing the market. We'll see how Madam Web does, but I, I, I just don't know about this one. Also on February 14th, Bob Marley One Love hits theaters. Kingsley ben takes on the role of Bob Marley in this movie from Ronaldo Marcus Green, who brought us King Richard. The trailers for this seem to be hitting a lot of the familiar biopic music beats. Bob Marley's got to think about his whole life before he goes on stage. But I've been surprised by these kinds of movies before. I just hope it's not sort of a surface level recitation of Bob Marley's Wikipedia page. If it seems like there's a bunch of people holding their breath on the internet, it's because on February 22nd, the live-action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender hits Netflix. Yes, it's a show now, 14 years after M. Night Shyamalan's disastrous live-action attempt. Netflix is now attempting to adapt this popular animated series properly. I cannot imagine how trepidatious this is making fans of Avatar The Last Airbender. I've never actually seen the original animated series, especially after having gone through what they did with the Shyamalan film. But One Piece was a hit with critics and fans. We'll see if Avatar The Last Airbender can keep that streak going. On February 23rd, for Demon Slayer fans, there's a special theatrical event, the To the Hashira training special featuring the last episode of the Swordsmith Village arc and the first episode of the new Hashira training arc, which is being promoted as an hour-long episode. There is no official word on when the actual premiere for the newest episode of Demon Slayer is going to be. This is sort of a rolling global road show with special events that are happening all over the world, including earlier this year in Japan. I am a fan of Demon Slayer. I was converted by a good friend of mine, and I now watch the show. Mara watches the show. We love it. And so I'm excited about the new season, and I will definitely be there to see this first episode theatrically, which I believe is also being played in IMAX. On February 25th, remember The Walking Dead? Well, there's another, another, another show. The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, Rick and Michonne return in their own spinoff. And honestly, I think this would have been huge news five years ago. I'm curious to see what the interest is in it today, especially with the original Walking Dead show now being off the air. This was something that I think was generating a lot of excitement, but how much of that is carrying over? We'll see. On March 1st, God, I wish this movie would just come out already. Dune Part 2, which was one of those things that was on last year's preview show. It was rescheduled from last fall due to the actor strikes. It's the second in Denis Villeneuve's seemingly cursed series when it comes to release dates between the strike and the pandemic. I just need to see this movie. I need this movie to be inside my head. I love the first Dune movie. I cannot wait for this one. Denis Villeneuve says he wants to make a third one. Hopefully, I'll still be on board for a third one but it seems like we've been waiting forever for this film. Let's just get it out already. 
On March 8th, Kung Fu Panda 4 hits theaters. Viola Davis voices the villainous chameleon as Jack Black's Poe works to ascend to the role of spiritual leader. As with so many other franchises, Ki Hui Kwan also joins the cast. I am happy for him. He should get that work. Get that work, Ki Hui Kwan. Uh, Kung Fu Panda 4, I, I, normally I would say that it is a surefire theatrical hit, but it doesn't seem like there are any surefire theatrical hits. It seems like this is about as close as you could get. Let's see if the audience is still there for a fourth Kung Fu Panda movie. Also on March 8th, the film Damsel hits Netflix from the director of 28 Weeks Later. Millie Bobby Brown plays a fairy tale princess who has to square off against a dragon after being tricked into a romance with a prince. Robin Wright, Angela Bassick, Nick Robinson, and Ray Winstone co-star. This was postponed from an October release date due to the actor strike. And also on March 8th, from A24 comes the film Love Lies Bleeding, directed by Rose Glass, the director of Saint Maud. Kristen Stewart falls in love with a bodybuilder, played by Katie O'Brien as they get mixed up in the dirty dealings of Stewart's father, played by Ed Harris. This seems like the kind of movie that I usually dig, and honestly, if Kristen Stewart chose to do it, then I want to see it because I love her career choices. She's just made interesting decisions post-Twilight when she's had the freedom to do so. So yeah, A24, Kristen Stewart, I'm there. On March 21st, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss return with Three Body Problem, their new series on Netflix based on the Chinese sci-fi novel by Liu Shichen. I don't know much about this series based on the trailer, other than that it looks big and expensive, and really, if you give Benioff and Weiss something big and expensive, what could possibly go wrong? I do love some good sci-fi, though, so if this is great, if this is early Game of Thrones great, then I'll be super happy. Let's see what happens. That same day, March 21st, is a remake of Roadhouse, the Patrick Swayze classic directed by Doug Lyman, starring Jake Gyllenhaal in the Patrick Swayze role. Listen, I have no need for a remake of this movie, and yet I am fascinated by the fact that it was chosen for a remake and that Doug Lyman is doing it and that Jake Gyllenhaal is starring in it. You know, what? I'm going to give this a flyer just out of sheer curiosity. Coming on March 29th is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, another movie that was on last year's show that was slated for release in 2023. Ice ghosts invade New York and multiple generations of ghosts. Ghostbusters fight back, including the returning cast from the last film, the original Ghostbusters, and new additions including Kumail Nanjiani, Pat Oswalt, and more. I was one of the people that liked Ghostbusters Afterlife. I liked it quite a bit, so I'm looking forward to a new Ghostbusters film. If we can actually successfully revive the Ghostbusters franchise and start putting out new movies, then I'm going to be happy because... I like Ghostbusters. And also on March 29th, if I can, this is going to be a double feature, although it'll probably be in limited release. The new film from Bong Joon-ho hits theaters called Mickey 17. Robert Pattinson plays a reincarnated space explorer. Tony Collette, Mark Ruffalo, and Steven Yeun also co-star. This goes near the top or at the top of my most anticipated list for 2023 based on the cast, based on Bong Joon-ho. It's science fiction. It seems like this movie was engineered for me. I could always be setting myself up for a letdown, but I really can't wait to see Mickey 17. Moving on to April, on April 12th, Godzilla X Kong, Godzilla Times Kong, the new Empire hits theaters. Adam Wingard returns to direct this team-up movie. We've had Batman v Superman, now it's Godzilla X Kong teaming up to fight another big monster. Dan Stevens joins the cast. The new MonsterVerse has been... Very hit or miss for me. I liked Kong Skull Island. I liked 2014's Godzilla. The King Kong vs. Godzilla movie was pretty good. I wasn't a huge fan of King of the Monsters, and it's really going to be hard to escape the shadow of Godzilla Minus One, which I don't think that this movie was planning on doing, but uh, yeah, we'll see how this one is. Also on April 12th, the first season of Fallout hits Amazon Prime Video, the adaptation of the popular video game. I don't know much at all about the game series, but the cast seems strong, and I like the look of it. It seems to have a very dark sense of humor so I will give it a shot and between this movie and The Last of Us and some of the movies that are hitting theaters could we actually be living in the era of some halfway decent video game adaptations who knows on April 19th, we get Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar Giver, the second part of Zack Snyder's sci-fi saga, or probably Part 1.5, since I'm sure that I'll inevitably be told that the first version is just a preview of the real movie, which is the longer director's cut, which we're going to get sometime later, which really begs the question, since it's on streaming, why not just put out the director's cut and make that the movie? But you know, I don't understand, apparently. It's too complex for my human brain to grasp. I didn't like the first part of Rebel Moon. Maybe the second part will be great. The first part is all just kind of bad setup and the second part is the payoff the action and stuff which Zack Snyder is not bad at but uh you know I mean always an open mind I didn't expect much from the Snyder cut and it surprised me so maybe I'll repeat that experience with this movie 
Currently also on the schedule for April 19th is an untitled Universal Monster movie from Radio Silence, the directing duo behind Ready or Not, Scream, and Scream 6. It stars Dan Stevens and Melissa Barrera, reported to be about Dracula and some kidnappers who invoke his anger. This alleged Dracula movie supposedly wrapped not too long ago, so we'll see if it sticks to this release date, if it moves, but if it stays, April could very well be the month of Dan Stevens. On April 26th, we get Civil War, the latest movie from writer-director Alex Garland of Annihilation and Ex Machina fame. Civil War, based on the trailers, feels a little too real. It's set in a U.S. that is in the process of a ruinous civil war tearing the country apart. Kirsten Dunst, Kaylee Spaney, Jesse Plemons, and Nick Offerman are part of the cast. Alex Garland has always been a divisive director. This is a movie that's literally about division, but I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe he meant for it to be closer to reality. I hope that we don't turn the way that this movie goes, but uh, yeah, this could be a bit of a, a tough watch. On April 26th, another movie that was on last year's show, Challengers, finally hits theaters from director Luca Guadagnino. Zendaya, Josh O'Connor, and Mike Faist form a pro-tennis love triangle. The movie was bumped from last fall's release schedule due to the actor's strike. The trailer hit last year seemed to catch some buzz when it initially dropped. Let's see if the movie can recapture that buzz. And then at some point in April, there's no release date as of filming this video. Star Trek Discovery Season 4 Five hits Paramount Plus, the 10 episode final season of the initial flagship series of the streaming era of Star Trek. Filming ended over a year ago, and with Picard also wrapped and Discovery coming to an end, that leaves Strange New Worlds as the only live action Star Trek series currently in production. With all of the questions around streaming, we'll see when the next live action series actually gets the green light. Moving on to summer, there are a couple of projects that aren't currently dated. One of them is House of the Dragon Season 2 on HBO and Max, the continuation of the war between Targaryens, one of the few shows largely unaffected by the strikes due to the fact that it shoots with British actors under a different union agreement. That's why it's hitting that summer release date. We'll see if it can match the hype of Season 1. Also, at some point this summer, Beverly Hills Cop Axel F will hit Netflix. Eddie Murphy's back as Axel Foley in the fourth Beverly Hills Cop film and first since the 1990s. Old favorites return alongside new cast members including Kevin Bacon and Joseph Gordon and Levitt. The movie's from the writers behind the unbearable weight of massive talent, which gives me a little bit of hope. Most of the time, these decades later sequels and especially comedy sequels don't work, but let's hope that they can re-bottle some of that magic that Eddie Murphy brings to the character. Looking at the month of May, at some point the date has not yet been released, and Kuti Gatwa takes over as the 15th Doctor on Doctor Who as it launches a new era, airing on the BBC in the UK as always, but also worldwide on Disney Plus in a new distribution deal. On May 3rd in the summer kickoff spot, The Fall Guy is the kickoff of the summer movie season. David Leach directs based on the Lee Majors TV show from the 80s. Ryan Gosling plays a stuntman who has to rescue the movie's real actor while seemingly starting some kind of a flirty relationship with the movie's director, played by Emily Blunt. This movie just looks like fun. On May 10th, Back to Black, the Amy Winehouse biopic directed by Sam Taylor Johnson hits theaters. Marissa Abela plays Amy Winehouse. For people that were in theaters, perhaps they'll stay home on May 16th, which sees the debut of Bridgerton Season 3, Part 1 on Netflix. It's the first part of the Netflix drama's third season, and it seems like this is the new model, sort of a hybrid binge-slash-weekly approach where you release a batch of episodes and then like four to six weeks later you release the next batch of episodes i'm not a huge fan of this model but i guess if it helps to space out the viewing then the streamers well i was going to say know what they're doing but i don't think any of the streamers have known what they were doing for a long time on may 17th we get if or if from john krasinski who writes and directs it's about a young girl who can see a world packed with imaginary friends she enlists the help of ryan reynolds and the movie also includes an all-star cast of voices including steve carell i like that this is a different type of movie movie than we've seen from John Krasinski, and we'll see how it fares in the summer movie season. On May 24th, we get Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. George Miller returns to his own Mad Max universe with a prequel film about Charlize Theron's Furiosa. Anya Taylor-Joy takes over as Furiosa with Chris Hemsworth joining as Dementis. I love Mad Max Fury Road. I love this universe. Hopefully this is worth the wait and worth the return. Usually the prequel movie thing I'm a little trepidatious about, and I am a bit with this movie, but... 
George Miller made one of my favorite movies of the 21st century with Mad Max Fury Road, so I have faith that he'll be able to execute this new vision. Also on May 24th, as of now, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes hits theaters. The writers of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes return alongside some other new writers and a new director, Wes Ball. There's no Andy Serkis involvement this time, as the movie picks up long after the last Apes trilogy with Caesar's descendant on a planet fully of the apes. It is a risky thing to try to live up to that last Apes trilogy, which I think was one of the best modern movie trilogies. We'll see if it can continue the winning run for the new Apes movies, or if it kind of goes the way of the last Apes series, where they just run the idea into the ground. Also on May 24th is the Garfield movie from Sony, an animated film about the lasagna-loving cat who's voiced by the only person apparently who can voice beloved cartoon characters now, Chris Pratt. It's from Mark Dindal, who directed The Emperor's New Groove and Chicken Little for Disney. Nicholas Holt voices John Arbuckle with Harvey Guillen as Odie. Samuel L. Jackson also voices a character. I mean, maybe Chris Pratt has the Midas touch when it comes to animated character voice movies. Moving on to June, on June 7th, we get Ballerina, the spinoff movie to the John Wick series starring Ana de Armas. It appears that some of the John Wick main cast will cameo in the film as well. They seem to be really aggressively expanding the Wickiverse. The movie's directed by Lynn Wiseman. It's written by Shea Hatton, who wrote John Wick 3 and John Wick 4. And um, yeah, again, it's the whole spinoff thing. It could go great. It could go not so great. The Continental was kind of a divisive series, the first expansion of the John Wick universe. And yeah, We'll see if this is a character and a series that can support multiple different spinoff movies and series. Also on June 7th is the movie The Watchers, the debut film from writer-director Ishana Knight Shyamalan, daughter of M. Night Shyamalan. The movie stars Dakota Fanning. It's about a group of people being stalked by creatures in a spooky forest. We don't know much more than that. On June 13th, we get Bridgerton Season 3, Part 2, the second half of the third season of Bridgerton. And on June 14th, we get Inside Out 2. Meg Lefov, who co-wrote the first film, returns as solo screenwriter, with first-time feature director Kelsey Mann taking over as director of the film. There are a few voice changes as well. Bill Hader is being replaced as Fear by Tony Hale. Mindy Kaling's Disgust is being taken over by voice actress Liza Lapira, and Maya Hawke joins as a new emotion, Anxiety. There are also so more emotions that are being teased. I love the first Inside Out movie, but I feel like they kind of painted a pretty clear picture of how the emotions work in that film. So when you try to throw in even new characters, you could have a bit of a Poochie syndrome here. And again, Pixar, this would seem to be one of the safest box office bets ever. And yet we have Lightyear and we have so many other Pixar films recently that just haven't performed very well. Maybe Inside Out 2 is the movie that will kickstart Pixar back in theaters. Currently on the schedule for June 14th as well is Bad Boys 4. Adil and Bilal return to direct the fourth Bad Boys film. Filming started last spring before being interrupted due to the actor strike, so we'll see if this release date sticks. On June 21st, The Bike Riders hits theaters starring Austin Butler, Jodie Comer, Tom Hardy, Michael Shannon, Mike Feist, Norman Reedus, and more in the latest from Arkansas native director Jeff Nichols. Gotta give a shout out to the hometown director there. It premiered at Telluride last fall to positive reviews, was delayed, and then switched distributors. It's about a fictional motorcycle club in the 1960s. I like the cast. I like the director. So I'm looking forward to it. It's as simple as that. On June 28th, we get A Quiet Place Day One, which is directed and written by Michael Sarnoski, whose first film was Nicolas Cage's Pig, a movie that I really liked. John Krasinski came up with the original story, and it's a prequel to the first Quiet Place film, starring Lupita Nyong'o, Joseph Quinn, Alex Wolf, and Jaimin Onsu. This seems to be the summer of the prequel in many ways, and this is another one where I really like the first Quiet Place movie. I liked the second one quite a bit, too. We'll see if this can round out the trilogy. The fact that you have Michael Sarnoski, I like liked Pig. Is it too much of a big budget jump to this project or is he going to be one of those directors who can go from a small movie to a bigger one? Also on the schedule for June 28th is Horizon, an American saga. It's been 20 years since Kevin Costner directed a film, which was 2003's Open Range. Now he's directing a two-part Western that he's also writing and starring in. The cast is massive. The budget is reportedly around $100 million per movie. Can he revive the great American Western? Many people have tried. There are a lot of resources going into both of these movies, which are taking up not one, but two slots on the release schedule. Who knows? I mean, honestly, when it comes to the box, office and everything else after 2023 and the flops and surprise hits that we got 
I'm done trying to predict exactly how a different genre or a different movie is going to do. On July 3rd, we get Despicable Me 4, as reliable a box office draw as there is right now. The fourth Despicable Me film hits just in time for July 4th with a script from Mike White. We'll see if there was any sort of strike-related delay in the production, but I think that it headlines a pretty sparse July right now, so I think it's safe to say that this is probably going to hit the release date. On July 19th, the movie I'm less confident about as far as hitting the release date Twisters, the sequel to the original Twister from Lee Isaac Chung, the director of Minari. That's a big step up. Daisy Edgar Jones, Glenn Powell, Anthony Ramos are part of the cast. Glenn Powell has said that there are no returning characters in this movie, although perhaps they could be related to the characters from the first film, but it doesn't seem like you're going to see Helen Hunt or any of the people that are still around. The first Twister movie isn't some cinematic masterpiece. I think that it's likable in a way uh, because of its flaws. Will Twisters be able to tap into that or will it seem kind of empty. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about this, but I also am kind of fascinated by tornadoes, so we'll see if they can come up with anything fresh. Finally, on July 26th, the movie that was at one point supposed to kick off the summer, Deadpool 3, Mr. Pool officially joins the MCU. The film was pushed back due to the writers and actor strikes. Hugh Jackman is definitely back. Everybody knows that. There are some other spoiler pictures that have hit that I've tried to avoid. The MCU is not in the best place right now. Currently, this is the only MCU film scheduled to hit theaters in 2024. Other films have been pushed back to 2025 and later. Will this be the movie that helps? to recapture their box office magic. It'll have been six years, more than six years, since Deadpool 2 by the time this one hits theaters. It seems like people are excited for this movie, but I mean, who knows? Where does the decline stop when it comes to the MCU? August is actually currently pretty crowded. On August 2nd, we have a new M. Night Shyamalan movie reportedly called Trap. We know that Josh Hartnett is in it, and he's believed to have a major role, and that it's said to be a thriller set at a concert, but that's about it. On August 9th, we have Borderlands, the adaptation of the video game directed and co-written by Eli Roth, who ceded directorial duties to Tim Miller for some additional shooting while he was wrapped up doing Thanksgiving. Kate Blanchett stars with Kevin Hart, Jack Black, and Jamie Lee Curtis, among others. Also on August 9th, Flint Strong is scheduled to hit theaters. It's directed by Rachel Morrison, who made history as the first woman ever nominated for Best Cinematography at the Academy Awards. The movie's written by Barry Jenkins, and it's a biopic about boxer Clarissa T. Rex Shields, starring Ryan Destiny and Brian Tyree Henry, perhaps an awards contender for next year. On August 16th, as of right now, a new Alien film is scheduled to hit theaters, currently titled Alien Romulus, directed by Fede Alvarez and starring Kaylee Spaney. It's reportedly a standalone film set between Alien and Aliens. And much like Mean Girls, this was also originally intended to be a streaming movie, but the strategy was changed once the economics around streaming changed. So instead of watching it at home, you'll probably watch it in theaters or more likely still end up watching it at home. Also on August 16th, Horizon and American Saga Chapter 2 opens, the second chapter of Kevin Costner's Big Gamble. We'll see how that works out. And on August 30th, Craven the Hunter, which was featured on last year's show as a movie that I said was allegedly releasing in 2023. I believe the words I said were, I'll believe it when I see it. This movie is finally supposedly coming out. It was scheduled for release back in October, delayed almost a year due to the actor strike. Things aren't exactly great for comic book movies right now, so maybe by August things will be better. I don't really know. This is a rated R film. It's not really a character that's directly tied, at least through the trailers and stuff, to Spider-Man in the way that Venom was. I think that this kind of has flop written all over it, but... I've thought that about other movies that did really well at the box office before, so maybe this taps into some Venom-like enthusiasm and becomes a surprise hit. Or maybe it's Morbius. Moving on to the fall, currently scheduled and there's no actual date is Agatha Darkhold Diaries on Disney+. Plus. It could move up, it could move back. This is also the third title for the show, so it could completely change titles. It's kind of weird that we're still waiting for a spinoff show that was basically launched by a meme almost three years ago, but, you know, here we are. Then in September, on September 6th, we have Beetlejuice 2. Tim Burton and Michael Keaton return, along with many of the original cast. Jenna Ortega and Willem Dafoe are also in this 30-plus year later sequel to Beetlejuice, who does not seem to be going Hawaiian. It's good that the original team is back, but I mean, obviously, I am a little trepidatious about a Beetlejuice sequel at this point. However, in Michael Keaton, I trust, because even The Flash, which is a movie I didn't love, I liked Michael Keaton in it, so if he can bring that energy to Beetlejuice, this could actually be almost a really interesting, different take on the character. 
I don't know. On September 13th, we get Transformers 1, Toy Story 4 director Josh Cooley heads up this animated origin film about the beginnings of the Autobot Decepticon War with Chris Hemsworth as Optimus Prime. That's a big change. Keegan-Michael Key as Bumblebee, Brian Tyree Henry as Megatron, Scarlett Johansson as Alita, and more. I think it's interesting to explore this area in the Transformers mythology. I do kind of wonder why they never did this in any of the actual movies. That was my favorite part about Bumblebee and some of these later Transformers films when you actually actually got into that sort of 80s Megatron, Cybertron type thing. But, you know, if it does it in animation, if it works in animation, then there's not really a big bar to clear when it comes to great Transformers films. On September 20th, currently DreamWorks Animation has The Wild Robot on the schedule from Chris Sanders, the writer-director of How to Train Your Dragon and the Croods, based on the best-selling book series by Peter Brown. Also currently on September 20th is the film Wolves, not Wolves, Wolves, starring George Clooney and Brad Pitt as two fixers sent to do the same job. It's written and directed by John Watts. This is an Apple original film, but George Clooney reportedly negotiated specifically for it to get a theatrical release, so like Killers of the Flower Moon, and Napoleon. It is an Apple original film that will hit theaters first. And on September 27th, we have Saw 11. John Kramer was successfully revived in the prequel Saw X or Saw 10, which means it's time to start running everything into the ground again in what is reported to be a prequel sequel. There's no director or star confirmation yet, but given the fact that these things are pretty quick and pretty cheap to make, I think it's likely that it sticks to this date and that there will be some people in some traps at some point. On October 4th, we get Joker Fali Adieu, sequel to the Billion Dollar Shocker 2019 film Joker, which won Joaquin Phoenix an Oscar. Lady Gaga joins as Harley Quinn, with Phoenix and director Todd Phillips returning. The title refers to a shared delusion between two people, which lines up well with these characters. And this is a movie that I don't really know how to make heads or tails of. Was 2019's Joker lightning in a bottle? Can you recreate that magic? Or could this be the most unlikely franchise of all time. I could see this movie going so many different ways. It is probably the one that I'm the most curious about in 2024. Currently scheduled for October 18th is Smile 2, Parker Finn reportedly returning to write and direct, and Naomi Scott has been cast. Listen, the sequel to this film was inevitable. I liked the first Smile film. Let's see what they do with the second. I hope they don't just run into the ground like every other horror franchise. On October 25th, we get Terrifier 3, and this franchise fascinates me. Terrifier 2 made millions off of a very small budget as a sequel to a movie that very few people saw. The third film is going with a holiday theme, and we'll see if it can build on the success of the first two, but if Terrifier 3 can outdo Terrifier 2, then the trajectory of this will be one of the most unique stories we've seen as far as box office in a very long time. Also currently scheduled for October 25th, though my confidence level is very low, is Wolfman. Lee wan is directing this reimagining of the Wolfman that was originally set to star Ryan Gosling. He's been replaced by Possessor's Christopher Abbott. Given the cast changes and the fact that we don't really know anything about the production, I think it's very likely, very possible that this gets pushed from October. But this is also a Blumhouse film, and they have a way of making the impossible possible. So maybe it sticks. On November 8th, Venom 3 is scheduled to hit theaters. Kelly Marcel, the writer of the previous two films, is directing the third movie. We know it stars Tom Hardy and that it was delayed due to the actor strike, but that's about all we know. On October 15th is a movie that was mentioned on last year's show called Red One. Filming on this one wrapped in February of 2023, but it's not set for theatrical release until this November in 2024. Jake Casson is directing Fast and Furious writer Chris Morgan wrote it, and it stars The Rock, Chris Evans, and J.K. Simmons as Santa Claus. It's an action Christmas movie. I don't know. Seems like it could be fun. On November 22nd, Gladiator 2 hits theaters. Ridley Scott is back as director with Paul Mescal playing Lucius, the nephew of Joaquin Phoenix's Commodus in the first film. Connie Nielsen is back as his mother, Lucilla, and Denzel Washington plays a former slave looking to exact revenge on the Roman Empire. Pedro Pascal is also reportedly cast in an unknown role, and shooting was delayed due to the strike, so even though it is still on the release calendar for November. I could see this movie potentially getting pushed to next summer, summer of 2025, if the post-production just doesn't come together well. This is the hard part with doing a preview for later on in the year. The calendar is so fluid, and some of these movies are inevitably going to be delayed. 
On November 27th, John M. Chu directs Wicked Part 1, the big screen version of the smash Broadway musical about the origins of the Wicked Witch from The Wizard of Oz, which is being split into two movies released a year apart. Cynthia Erivo plays Elphaba, the role originated by Adina Menzel on stage, and Ariana Grande plays Glinda, the Good Witch, which Kristen Chenoweth played on stage. Jeff Goldblum plays The Wizard of Oz. I hope that this is perhaps a very successful big screen adaptation because I do love musicals and I would love for the big screen musical to make a comeback and for us to get even more of them. Also, TBD in November supposedly is the second season of Arcane, Netflix's acclaimed League of Legends animated series, which if it debuts in November would come out about three years after season one. Attack on Titan fans are laughing. That's nothing. I really, really liked this series. I hope it continues on its current track and maybe if season two is successful that it could be a little bit less of a wait before season three. Scheduled for December 13th is The Lord of the Rings, The War of the Rohirrim, an animated Lord of the Rings film from Kenji Kamiyama, who's an anime veteran. It's the story of Helm Hammerhand, the legendary king of Rohan, who's going to be voiced by Brian Cox. And it's about a war that happened over two centuries before the events of the Rings film. I'm a Lord of the Rings nut, so I hope this is great. Also currently scheduled for December 13th is an untitled Karate Kid movie. We'll see if it sticks to this date. We don't really know much other than the fact that Ralph Macchio and Jackie Chan will both appear seemingly uniting the Karate Kid universes. It doesn't seem like this is a continuation of the events in Cobra Kai. They just launched a big global casting search for a role in the film. I think they're motivated to get this out in 2024 because it's the 40th anniversary year of the original Karate Kid in 1984, but the lack of information about the film has me a bit skeptical. Maybe they'll be able to pull it together by the end of the year. On December 20th is Mufasa, The Lion King, the prequel to Disney's 2019 CGI live-action feeling remake of the original. This was delayed from summer due to the actor strikes. Aaron Pierre voices a young Mufasa with Kelvin Harrison Jr. as young Scar, and it's directed by Barry Jenkins. Also currently on December 20th, this could be a big showdown, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is on the schedule. Jeff Fowler returns as director, as do Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and alternate juror James Marsden. Shadow the Hedgehog also reported to appear in this movie. And then on Christmas Day, December 25th, 2024, Nosferatu hits theaters. Robert Eggers follows up The Northman with his version of the original Dracula tale starring Nicholas Holt, Emma Corrin, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Bill Skarsgård, Lily Rose Depp, and Willem Dafoe. And this is really interesting because Willem Dafoe was nominated for an Academy Award back in 2001 for playing Max Schreck in the film Shadow of the Vampire, who was the actor who played Nosferatu in the iconic silent version. And and now here he is in a different adaptation of the same story. It's like movieception. I like Robert Eggers. I like his movies. I like Nosferatu. I think this could be really interesting. Christmas is a curious time to release it, but hey, you know, if you can get people in the seats, I guess it doesn't really matter what time of the year you release it. But yeah, this goes near the top of my list as far as most anticipated for the year. There are a few other projects that are supposedly coming out in 2024 that we don't have release dates for just yet. The third season of The Bear, which hopefully will give me time to watch the first two seasons. I hear it's really, really good. will hit at some point this year. Knuckles on Paramount Plus you would think would hit sometime before Sonic the Hedgehog 3 in December. The Penguin series on Max is supposed to finally be hitting streaming this upcoming year. Also, the final season of You on Netflix. The fifth season will be its last, but it will be out sometime in 2024. X-Men 97 on Disney Plus is slated for release this year. The revival of one of my favorite animated series of all time. And then The Boys Season 4. I think this is a first quarter release. We should be getting this pretty soon will be hitting Amazon Prime Video at a date that will probably be announced very soon. And that's my look at just some of the projects that are coming out this year. But as you can tell, there's actually a lot. Will this arrest some of the box office decline that we've seen the last few years? Will there be a comeback for some of these franchises and different genres? Or will this be a perpetuation of what we've seen, which is that the theatrical model may really be losing steam and the entertainment industry may be immutably changed, even though so many of those changes were based on assumptions about how people can make money that didn't turn out to be true. 2024, I think is going to be a very interesting and consequential year for entertainment and I'm excited to cover it all right here on the channel. 
Thank you so much for watching this preview. What are you most excited about of all the stuff that I listed here? Let me know down in the comments below and stay tuned right here. I've got charts coming out later this week. I've got the debut of my new show, which is sort of a wrap up of entertainment news and other stuff that I want to talk about. So there's a lot ahead. I hope you have a wonderful new year as we get started into 2024 and I'll see you very soon. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.